this is the funniest thing. Okay, so I'm watching these videos about Atherton's housing element. So Atherton, if you don't know, it's this little town on the San Francisco Peninsula. So there's San Francisco, and it exists down here. This entire town was basically created to isolate a bunch of rich people's um, tax revenue. It's an exclusionary sort of community, and it really, like... If you look at Menlo Park, which sits next to it, it's just a cutout of it. It was like some former ranch that existed, um, and they wanted to not have to have anything other than single-family homes and only rich homes in this area. So it's kind of wild. Anyways, I'm watching the videos about their housing element meeting that they had um, October 11th, but then they just recently had a meeting where the state had sent them the response to their housing element, and it was... Oh, chef's kiss. Amazing. Um, they eviscerated Atherton's housing element because Atherton thinks that they can put only ADUs in their entire thing. So accessory dwelling units are those like little granny flats that you put in your backyard. They don't actually want to upzone for anything more. They're like, we're just not going to do anything other than just allow some backyard homes. And we think that's enough. And of course, the state's like, no. You need to zone for some affordable housing, some apartments. You have to do what's actually in the law. And it's wild to me because these people have consultants. They're paying for high-priced consultants to help them develop their housing element that are telling them, yeah, this ain't going to work. But we're going to do it anyways. We're going to see what the state says. And of course, the state says that ain't going to work. So I went back and I started watching the older city council meetings um, to see what actually went back and forth in these conversations. And public comment was what you would expect. Watch. Just the one comment I'll make is that, as everyone knows, we've received a fair amount of national press on this subject. And that yeah. national press is focused on criticizing Atherton for what they call being in not in my backyard. Movies. We don't want the housing in our backyard. In fact, the strategy that Atherton has published and sent to the state is a 100% strategy or nearly 100% strategy of yes, in our backyards. We're, we're focused on ADUs, on accessory dwelling units, and that is absolutely in our backyards. Okay, so they're allowing homes in their backyards, so they're yes in my backyard. I just wanna make you all aware of our neighborhood voices. It's a nonprofit that we are trying to change the California Constitution, not... Okay, so this is uh, a NIMBY initiative to collect signatures to put something on the ballot that would reverse a bunch of housing laws and make it impossible for the state legislature to pass laws that require cities to allow for housing. It's wild ca.org and that's an organization that's trying to get cities to join them to sue the state of california um i believe to reduce their what they're doing to all of us now and also for them to correct the math they are on this tizzy that they think the state miscalculated and double counted it's wild conspiracy nonsense they're trying to sue the state you see this all over the state of California in public comments from generally well-off white boomers that don't like the fact that we have to build more housing. You won't like the comment tonight, but we, across the board, felt that the state is not going to honor our report. No, and that they won't. We need, Atherton needs to undertake a legal review. Uh, at the table were four lawyers, all in Atherton, that do not believe that this law is legal. I have no idea. I'm not a lawyer. What law? But I think in our hip pocket, housing we should law? have a legal review because this law changes the character of our town as the report to the state has pointed out. And we have a very unique situation. No, yes, I understand there are bad optics. I understand there's bad press, but that compared to devaluation of your property, there it is. to me comes second, quite there frankly. It is. That's and I see significant devaluation. This is the most common thing that you'll hear in these really rich, affluent neighborhoods at public comment, that everyone's biggest concern is property values. That if you allow for more housing, especially low-income housing, then their property values, which are propped up based on the scarcity, could be hurt. And that is their biggest concern. Not that people need housing. 
in a housing crisis. It's so gross to hear. Like it really hits you hard how much these people have privilege and they don't care. They just care about their property values. We're on a street that has two and a half empty acres. Do I want to see God knows what on that parcel? And Santiago is another street that has a parcel where the owner, the new owner had planned to build multifamily. There are three properties that have sold on that street in the last few months for over 15 million that are teardowns. It will absolutely destroy the values of some of these streets and some of these homes that are in town. What price do you put on that? Are you kidding? What price do you put on that? Human lives? People being housed? The new months for all us. All right, I have to skip this lady because she's down or infuriating. Or I'm Greg Conlon at 43 Virginia. And Okay, so this guy is running for council in uh, the town of Atherton, and he's probably one of the biggest enemies, but his entire premise for running is simply because he just doesn't like state housing law, and he wants to run to fight it. I'm one of the candidates for uh, the town council in this election in a few weeks, so I, and I believe, uh, and I know that the only reason I'm running is because of this issue, because I've been in this town for over four decades, and I just, I love this town, and I hate to see a bunch of... Uh, Legislators, I'll do them justice, come in and uh, try and take over our town without without any authority to do so other than we got a poor constitution. If this were the federal government with the state, a, a 10th amendment would, would not allow the federal government to, to dictate the legislation and the rule. I can't. The legislation and the rule of the local government. I mean, local government should decide local rules. And I think that's inherent in our society and our nation. And it's just, uh, this is such a common argument from these enemies. They want a system of complete total local control, which is completely backward from the way that our federal government and state government systems work. We have a system of supremacy. It's laid out in our constitution where the federal government has certain powers and then they delegate certain powers to the state government and the state government under its own discretion can then delegate certain powers to local municipalities or other districts. That's what we have. So one of the things that we generally delegate to local municipalities is local land decisions. And just like you can have local police and certain other forms of government, your, your local government can control. But there's a framework for that. There's requirements. We have things like CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, that doesn't allow cities to do certain things with land use that could affect the entire region. Same thing happens for local land use decisions. We have requirements on cities that they have to, within limits, allow certain types of development to occur within their city and the local NIMBYs hate it because they don't get to s just take charge of their local government and deny regional needs or state needs and they fight it it's so common uh, the SB9 was the start of it and I just think that the uh, legislature that a legislator that that started SB9 is in a, from a city that has probably the poorest results of housing in the state. So how he can uh, impose that on every other city and get the votes to do it is amazing. And the sad part about it, when I talk to people about it, they said, you better be careful, Conlon, he may be governor in the next go around. So the person he's alluding to is Senator Scott Wiener, who's one of the biggest YIMBYs in the California legislature, put out a lot of good legislation, but is not the one that wrote SB9, the one that he has a problem with, that was actually um, our Senator Tony Atkins. She wrote SB9 with Wiener, but she's the primary author. So it's funny to me that he has to go after Senator Scott Wiener specifically because he's the target for a lot of these NIMBYs um, because he's passing most of our good housing legislation. I, I agree with the prior speaker that the real problem is at the state level, um, but that's not something that's going to be an immediate uh, solutions. We may be expecting too much of what we have proposed. It seems to me that California is pretty unlikely to accept what we have proposed. I know it was done in good faith. I know we spent a lot of time on it, but it's just not terribly realistic in getting to what they want to get to. So what I um, would offer up, and I'm sure this must have been considered, but I, I think if we're not already working on a plan B for when the California comes back and says, sorry, this doesn't cut it. Um, you know, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. So she's right. They should be working on a plan B. And I love her for being the voice of reason in Atherton that, yes, their housing element is just a farce um, and that they should be doing what they're supposed to. Because if they miss their deadline, then Atherton gets hit with 
all the consequences that come with missing your deadline, including being hit possibly with builder's remedy projects within the city of Antherton, and they won't have any control over what happens in those projects. So I like her. Okay, so a lot of the speakers pretty much make the same points over and over about problems with multifamily housing, how they can focus even harder on their ADO-only solution, which the state is not going to accept, but mostly talking about that point, and uh, sort of regurgitating the same points over and over. Anyways, uh, we eventually get to Jeremy, and Jeremy is um, a housing advocate. Uh, he's reviewed a bunch of the housing elements throughout the Bay Area. I know him. He's a good friend. Um, but he sort of spells it out for Atherton, explaining the problem with their housing element as it is, how unique it is, and how it probably won't pass muster with the state. So the next clip is uh, Jeremy Levine. He's a housing advocate. Um, only one, I think, that spoke at this meeting. Um, and he kind of spells it out, what's wrong with their housing element, what they know but are not willing to sort of deal with. Uh, it's interesting. Hi, good afternoon. I, uh, Jeremy Levine, I am the policy manager with the Housing Leadership Council. I do not live in Atherton, but I have been following the housing element process in Atherton and every other city in San Mateo County very closely. And I have appreciated watching this document develop, seeing the strategies that Atherton is considering to promote multifamily housing. I'm here today because I wanna bring a legal perspective about the housing element process, about the feasibility of the all ADU plan that you might not hear much today. Uh, I just want to put into perspective what Atherton is claiming is going to happen. Atherton is a city of slightly more than 2,100 households, mm. and the housing element is claiming that 280 ADUs are going to be built and rented on the open market, 90% at affordable rates. That's more than 10% of the town's houses becoming landlords, and in a community where the median home price is more than $8 million, it's nothing personal. I'm just guessing most of the residents don't need rental income. So again, there might be the charity in people's hearts to build and rent ADUs, but it's a pretty monumental task Atherton is, is discussing. I have never heard of any city anywhere doing anything like this. And Atherton is a pretty unique city in its, in its own way, um, partly because of the housing prices. And there's all this focus on ADUs, making the ADU number work. And I think that's important. 200 ADUs, but Atherton's housing element isn't just ADUs. There are a couple other components of the plan which HCD might not accept. For example, Atherton claims that 96 units are going to come from SB9 lot splits, even though, as far as I'm aware, the city hasn't approved any SB9 applications yet, even though it has received some, there's, there's some interest, but uh, there are pretty high standards that HCD has for counting SB9 units. So there's probably going to be some, like some of those units will need to go somewhere else. Atherton's claiming that 54 units are going to come from school and facility sites, even though I think there's only an actual plan to build four of those units. The rest of them are very speculative and uh, kind of based on unclear interest in some cases where the, uh, they're, they're pretty big constraints. So Atherton has on paper a plan for 440 units and I've just, you know, there are the 280 U's, but frankly, I think that 150 of the other units or 146 or whatever are also pretty dubious and uh, might not pass HCD muster. So, of course, there are a couple different strains, people making different proposals, and I break them into two camps. People saying we can only do the ADU only strategy and people saying we need to come up with a backup plan. I, I would say that it is very risky to not have a backup plan because the ADU only strategy right now is uh, just doesn't have the supporting evidence. Um, and, and if the city does want to support it, activists have made a lot of recommendations. But like I said, I, I don't know what the, the real options are. And I've read uh, every housing element in San Mateo County and a bunch in the rest of the Bay Area. So I'm seeing what everyone's doing. And this is kind of a uh, particularly interesting approach. So I, I appreciate the time that you're taking today to let the community talk. And I hope that you will consider the full, not just the ADUs, but every part of the housing element that needs to be addressed and, and which might not pass HCD muster. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other public comment? Look at her face. Uh, okay, so then we jump into the main meat of the meeting after we get the initial public comments done. And so planning staff does a presentation to the city council explaining to them their strategy for the housing element. And it's as you expect, they go through um, 
sort of basics of housing elements, um, changes to new laws. I mean, you see this all over the Bay Area when you have these like housing element workshops um, with different city councils or planning commissions. But um, they go through and they talk about the arena, what they're targeting for, what the state sort of expects. Um, but I don't see them go into like how they have really understood the problem with their housing element. And they talk about SB9 a lot. Um, as a solution for allowing for new housing. And SB9 is one of those laws that allows you to do lot splits by right. The thing is, there hasn't been any SB9 units built in the city of Atherton yet, and they've had a year, but they're projecting a ton of them, which is wild. The state's not really going to accept that. Uh, so they go on to talk about um, changes in housing, housing elements, anticipated HCD comments. And this is interesting because they know some of these comments are pretty much predicting what they're going to get back. They know that their housing elements have got to be insufficient. And then they go through the consequences, the things that we always talk about, how the state's going to come after these cities, find them, the AG is going to come after them. So these poor planning staff sort of understand the issue, but they're being directed by a city council that won't accept anything that will allow for the city to uh, do any upzoning within the city. In fact, um, in an earlier workshop at the city of Atherton, they had multifamily overlay sort of um, situation going on in their town. And as part of the feedback they've received, the citizens said, we don't like that. Don't do that. So they didn't do it, but then that makes their housing element even less sufficient. So it's wild to me that they listened to the citizens to do that when they knew it was just going to get them in trouble and be moot in the end. Like maybe they just wanted to go through the motions of doing this. Anyways. So, they continue on, keep talking about the consequences. There's a lot of talking about that in the EDU program. So uh, planning staff, but then you also have the consultant. Um, this consultant or specifically uh, is a consultant that I've seen in lots of different cities that they hire um, because one of the problems when you have a tiny town is your city may not have the expertise and it might have a small planning department. So it really can't understand all of the issues around building a compliant housing element. So you hire an outside consultant. I know this lady, she's pretty popular within the Bay Area for housing consultants to hire. Um, and uh, one thing I've noticed though, is a lot of the cities that do hire her are some of the cities that haven't been receiving um, compliant uh, reports back from the state. And I'm not saying that she's giving bad advice. She has on occasion said that it's sometimes inexperienced reviewers of the state, which seems a little dubious, but um, that's one sort of weird trend that I've seen. Although I've seen other consultants like Placeworks, others give bad advice to certain cities, and then those housing elements get kicked back. And uh, it's just, it's interesting to see that. I do seriously wonder with some of these housing element consultants, how much they really are pushing back on the cities to tell them, hey, this isn't going to work, or if they're misleading them to think what they are submitting is valid and they just don't know. I don't know. I think it's interesting. I know a lot of these consultants meet with the HCD, the housing, uh, uh, housing Community Development Department in the state, the one that reviews these things, and um, they get feedback so they should understand what's viable. And I'm wondering where that disconnect is with some of these NIMBY cities. Is it that they don't want to listen to their consultant even though they're hiring them? Um, is it the planning staff not communicating that properly back to the city staff? Is it the consultant not communicating it? There has to be some kind of disconnect because there's this pattern of submitting bad housing elements to the state, knowing full well they're bad. Maybe this is just some concerted effort by some of these towns to intentionally just look like they're doing the will of the voters and being dragged into a compliant housing element. That way they can save face politically. So what the state has done is to give HCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development, far more authority than it ever had before, and to give it specific authority to enforce um, a whole long list of housing laws, including housing element law. Um, HCD, if uh, we've represented a number of cities that have gotten what are now called notices of violation from HCD, where they basically threaten to sue you, or the, the attorney general has gotten active on his own part and has written his own notices of violation to cities on housing laws, and we've defended a number of those. Um, but HCDs I haven't won. Uh, HCD, anyway, the laws have really ramped up their authority. They have authority to do to prepare guidelines and they, without going through 
uh, the usual administrative procedures, which means they're pretty much done in a pretty opaque process, uh, like their housing element guidelines. As Diane said, they have a 40 page guide on developing and selecting housing sites and about a 75 page guide on affirmatively furthering fair housing. Their letters to cities are extremely lengthy and detailed. I, I might suggest you can go to ABAG actually posts um, a few cities that have been received in the Bay Area. And uh, HC, if you go to HCD's website, look for housing elements, they have uh, all their letters, their recent letters to cities posted, and they're pretty, they're pretty sobering. San Mateo got a, you know, which I think we yes, would generally consider a you know, relatively pro-housing city with a lot of development. No, they're not. Got a 14-page letter, which is the most incredibly nitpicking thing. Um, Hold on. No, San Mateo got a letter because they got cocky. They got super cocky in their letter. In fact, uh, I, I'll dive into the San Mateo thing in a bit. I can imagine. So uh, HCD, anyway. So HCD has a formal authority to refer non-complying jurisdictions to the attorney general for legal action. And uh, if a community has a housing element that HCD is not willing to approve, um, both the, att the attorney general, of course, can sue the city, or what we've seen more commonly recently is other interested parties can sue the city. And who are those interested parties? Um, well, there's a variety of them now. Some of the more common lawsuits, one's called uh, Yimby Law. Yes, in my backyard, Yimby. Uh, Yimby Law, which has sued a number of our clients and sometimes just jumps into lawsuits. Um, uh, the attorney general, by the way, oh, if a don't. project's turned down, we've had a couple of cases uh, where besides the developer suing the city, the attorney general has moved to intervene as well. Um, there's another group I called Carla. Let's see, California Renters Legal Assistance. That's, uh, that's another, uh, that's another other one word. of the MB groups. And then there's California, let's see, what does it say? California's, for how I have CFH, and I can't remember what it stands for, but it's, uh, it's financed by the realtors, and they've sued six cities in oh, Southern California. So, um, you know, they're often represented by major law firms, uh, which hope to get attorney's fees if they're successful. Because if a community is sued on housing element and loses, pays not only its own defense costs, but it will, it's, it will pay uh, attorney's fees. Also the way the case, usually if a developer sues a city, they don't get attorney's fees, but in the new housing laws, if a developer sues the city and is successful, they can also get attorney's fees. <laughs> so if there's a court it's order fucked. ordering a community to, uh, you know, finding your finding a community's housing element to be not in compliance with state law, um, and the community doesn't comply for a year, which I frankly think would be unlikely. Uh, they're possible to have fines of uh, anywhere from ten thousand, escalating to six hundred thousand a month. Um, eventually, if the community doesn't gives. comply, the court can draft the housing element itself. Um, and once a court, once a housing element is found to be out of compliance. Um, the court has the authority to either issue injunctions against building permits or order approvals of projects. Anyway, it has true. pretty broad authority over a over a community's um, community's uh, approvals of housing. Next slide. Focus so, as I mentioned, so HCD has this new division <laughs> called Proactive Enforcement. Um, uh, they have their enforcement division seems to have expanded somewhat uh, exponentially, and developers basically. If they're unhappy with uh, advice. So it expanded because we focused on pushing in the budget bill to staff more people to do this because it was important. We did a lot of advocating. We called into several uh, budget meetings to advocate for it, and we got it. It's governor signed it. So they're getting from a city. They'll complain to or the way they're treated by a city. They'll complain to HCD, which then may respond in a variety of ways. But in any case, from a housing element standpoint, yep. San Diego County's housing elements were the first ones due in this you know, new law. They were due in April of 2021. But to date, only eight of the 19 uh, communities in the county have had their housing elements approved by HCD. So a little more detail about this. Um, it, AFFH law with housing elements actually didn't take effect until partway through and San Diego was one of the first that had to do their housing elements. So they actually predated, they didn't actually have to fit with that. And it's wild to me that they didn't pull it off. I think they were just not expecting that this round of housing elements, because um, you do these every eight years, would be as um, 
as difficult as they are to pull off because they weren't taking them seriously. So they drug their feet as long as they did, or they stomped their feet uh, to protest having to do what they're supposed to. Like she talks about Coronado and uh, it, it's funny to me because comparing what Southern California did to what Northern California um, is doing is wild because Southern California learned a lot. Um, HCD learned a lot. New legislation was also passed in the middle and the new laws went to effect partway through the transition. So it's really apples and oranges when you compare the two. And I think the Northern California can take, um, they can learn some lessons from Southern California since Southern California went first, but it's really not the same situation, but there's a lot of like, well, if they're doing it, then we could do it. Right. And really they just have more grace for the Southern California than they're going to give for Northern California because they were figuring this all out in Southern California. And we extended deadlines for like some Southern California cities, which we're not going to do for Northern California. So it's funny that they want to compare themselves to all these cities. Uh, most of them have adopted housing elements, but most of them haven't been approved by HCD. And so recently HCD has amped it up a bit so a little more context on this specifically, um, you can, when you're doing your housing element process, you'll send a draft to the state to have it reviewed to see if it will be certified um, by the state and they will give you feedback and you can iterate with the state. And then they'll tell you if you adopt this housing element, it will be accepted, it'll be approved. Um, some cities have received rejection letters from the state saying, hey, this element doesn't beat state law but they'll still adopt it anyways and then the state will then say well if we're going to approve what you adopted or not because we didn't get to review it before you adopted it and some of these cities um i think eight of them in southern california that adopted something that wasn't compliant are now receiving letters from the state to say hey what are you doing that's not gonna pass um we're going to refer you to the attorney general for further action and your housing element is not valid so all of your local zoning is not valid anyways, so prepare. <laughs> and sent five quote inquiry letters to five of the uh, five of the eleven cities that don't have that haven't don't have uh, approved housing elements, um, saying when are you going to approve your housing element and do you know when are you going to change your housing element and do what we told you. And I thought it was somewhat um, interesting that. Four of those, four of the five communities that they sent the letters to are what you might call well, fairly wealthy communities, Coronado, Poway, Del Mar, and Solana Beach. The fifth La Mesa doesn't fall into that category, but I think they had a- Del Mar also specifically is getting hit with uh, uh, a builder's remedy project right now, and they have not approved any new housing in the really long time. And uh, in fact, they've actually had a population decrease because they haven't been approving housing. And now there's a big project that wants to build on the beach there. It's going to be an interesting battle. <laughs> developer complained to HCD about the city. Um, and so, uh, so the fact that Atherton is a small city won't protect it. One of the communities no. on this list, we actually we represent the New York Times. Three of the four of the communities on the list, or three of the communities on the list, sorry. Um, one of them has tried is now on so its bad. third effort to try to get a housing element approved by HCD. Um, in the LA area, uh, where the ele where the housing elements weren't due until October of 2015. 21. I'm sorry, 2015. Yeah, I wish 2021. Sorry. Um, up until at the beginning of the year, like only seven of the 197 jurisdictions have had their housing elements approved. The numbers are substantially higher now. There was a bill passed that it provides some advantages if they get the housing elements um, approved by October of this year. So I think it's up to 50 or 60 um, have had, but it just tells you about how difficult it is to get a housing element approved and how many there are. But the fact that there's a lot of um, non-complying elements does not mean that, you know, if, if you're one of the non-compliance that you're going to be, that you're going to be protected. Um, I think it was already referenced that, you know, the New York Times article about Atherton. Um, <laughs> Coronado, which is one of the communities that uh, has received this letter of inquiries, may or made the unfortunate comment that they were too small for any, anybody to pay attention to, which got picked up by HCD. I actually did a series of videos about Coronado and how brazen they were, and I sent those to HCD. Uh, 
because I thought they were funny and I thought HCD should watch it. And maybe that's actually why Coronado got um, got some extra attention. Mm. In one of their, um, anyway, um, anyway, and anyway, um, all I'm saying is they're particularly interested in going after uh, wealthy communities. One of the new requirements uh, in AFFH is that uh, housing elements analyze, quote, areas of affluence. So I kind of disagree with this, that they are specifically focused on that. Uh, I think it's more of, um, there's some bias here in that the communities that are fighting their housing elements the most happen to be the most wealthy cities. It's not the, they're wanting to pick on wealthy cities. It's just wealthy cities are the ones that were mostly born out of exclusion, born to be something that was going to fight against having um, areas of, of uh, affordable housing. And they know those are going to be the trouble cities. And uh, it's not that they're specifically looking at them. It's the way the law is written that every city has to do their part to allow for affordable housing, has to do their part to really start targeting people of all incomes instead of having um, areas that are specifically only for high income earners. And that's what's happening. Um, I wouldn't normally say this, but I think it's highly unlikely that HCD will approve the town's housing element if you it, without any multifamily zoning. It's true. Um, I recognize that the schools can have multifamily housing, but the, they're plans are probably too vague to satisfy HCD. I think as Diana said, they demand evidence that the housing really will be built. They've really made it, they seem to assume um, kind of projective abilities of cities that I don't think exist, but nonetheless, um, I, I, I think that's probably something that they're going to require um, and won't accept, you know, having the, the ADUs, um, you know, be, be such a huge proportion of the city's lower income housing Absolutely. So literally telling them what they need to hear, that their plan to do this only ADUs plan for meeting their housing element isn't going to work. Fuck. Um, and so it may just be something for the community to think about. But the letter's coming in a few weeks, and I guess we'll all know then. <laughs> so I'm recording this after I've already seen the letter that came in just recently, and then the meeting where they discussed the fact that they got this letter. So I will cover that next. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Lisa. Thank you. So the next slide, I just want to give a little bit. Of okay, so city council did one round of questions. It's really weird in Atherton, and I just, a little aside, it's one of the few cities where I've seen where they have council sessions or council community meetings or workshops where they provide like coffee and donuts for everybody and that they take public comment multiple times during the meeting and they don't put time limits on public comment. It's just a weird thing about Atherton. I've never seen that before. Okay, Deborah. And then I have a hand up from Josh. And if you could just restate your name and your residence. Deborah Holvick, 398 Fletcher Drive, Atherton. I hope I don't get audited by the state of California now. But anyway, Wow, if this isn't a real good argument for our neighborhood voices to change the constitution and get democracy back to the people. Get democracy back to the people, Jesus Christ. There is democracy. This is that NIMBY petition I was talking about earlier um, to change the constitution to flip our government upside down um, because they find it scary. This is really scary what's going on. But I do have some questions <laughs> for you. I know two people that have had to deal with low-income housing and in both cases, a lot of crime moved in. One neighborhood turned all gangs and everything because of this just... low housing, has it a low cost, low affordable housing. Has there been any studies by the California, <sighs> um, Housing California Development about this um, propensity of, towards crime and how to prevent it? Some sort of oversight so that you can uh, give people low income. Are you kidding me? Is she perpetuating this myth of, oh, this is so gross. Um, housing without bringing crime in. And then has there been any consideration? So we don't gross. have enough water in the state. We don't have enough electricity. We okay, well, that was totally off. <laughs> Residential use of water in the state of California is only 8%. Most of it goes to agriculture. Like I do a video debunking this, and yeah, we have enough electricity. This is wild. And that out in the last um, um, hot heat spell we had, there wasn't enough electricity. We have. <laughs> it's not enough electricity. It's that the lines themselves 
can't deal with having uh, that much load on them for everyone running their AC. It's not, it's infrastructure of the lines. It's not enough electricity. Roads all over the place that don't move. Middlefield doesn't move during rush hour. So has there been any consideration for traffic? Has there been any consideration for infrastructure? Who's gonna pay when you've turned a residential area into a multi-housing, so there's no more single family houses, it's all multi-housing. That's, well, okay. One, not everything's gonna turn into multifamily housing. Even Also, infrastructure is generally paid for by developers because we don't tax people enough because of Prop 13. And uh, cities can't pay for their own infrastructure. We end up passing like regressive taxes like bonds and sales taxes to pay for vital infrastructure. And then we sometimes expect developers to, as part of approval to get their project built, pay to like improve infrastructure. And then they'll complain about the price of the housing that was built is too much. Is another NIMBY tactic to attack that housing when they know full well they force that housing to pay for improvements for the entire neighborhood. It's wild to me. Um, who pays for this? Who pays for the infrastructure, the increase in police, the increase in fire, the increase in schools? Does it make our property tax? The people that move in with their tax revenue and they're going to be paying significantly more in property taxes than you do because they don't have Prop 13 protection because they're new. Jesus. So do we all pay for it through increase in property taxes, no, evacuation, because we can't. wildfires? It's illegal. Um, anyway, wildfires. does the You're HCD on the consider any of that or are they just going, oh, just put more houses on? I know Scott. Yes, they completely, uh, this is part of the evaluation for ABAG when they go through where they're going to decide which municipalities are going to receive their different rena allocations. Scott Weiner in San Francisco. Scott Weiner. No, his name is Weiner. He said he wants to get rid of all single family houses. No, he didn't. This is such nonsense they spread. He just wants everything in California to be multi um, family housing. So I think it's really scary, to tell you the truth. I think, I don't know who's behind this. I don't it's know why scary. the HCD who's behind also it? decided that we had to, you know. This has literally been law since like the 70s? Who decided? Like, this is been probably longer than you've lived in this community it's been a requirement but in Get millions and millions here. more houses in california um how is this going to help the quality millions and millions more houses in california because we have a housing shortage because people already live here because people need places to live because we have children that don't have homes um they're still living with their parents we have people overcrowded in the housing and we have people under house we have a massive homelessness crisis in california like get Get out of here, lady. Come on. Quality of life in California, and I'm not talking about Atherton and Woodside. I'm talking about every single city and town in California. So if you could address any of those you'd like, I'd appreciate it. Lisa? Through the mayor, um, just a question. We can track the comments and then respond at the end, or we can respond as we go. Uh, I think place. if you have a response, it's more appropriate to go ahead and respond directly. Absolutely. This is why well, I get this as a community meeting, but like in most public meetings, you usually wouldn't go back and forth with questions like that. City attorneys will generally advise against it because you can accidentally violate the Brown Act, but you sometimes can respond to a quick question if somebody has something. After each comment. Yeah. Okay. Diana, do you have any? I'll start. Um, first of all, I think that a lot of the issues, especially related to water and infrastructure, are facing every jurisdiction that I know of, that um, especially in the, um, even in San Mateo County, especially there's a concern that there's not going to be enough water supply for all these units that are having to be planned for, not just in okay. Atherton, but everywhere. I think there's a recognition of that. I think the same is with infrastructure, um, that things have to change and who's going to pay for that. These are questions every jurisdiction is grappling with. I just want to say that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not speaking on behalf of the state of California. I'm just letting you know what I'm seeing. Um, and the only other thing that I want to talk, mention is uh, with respect to crime. I know there's a lot of concern about crime in low income communities. And frankly, if you have a, a, a housing development, affordable housing development, they will be almost exclusively uh, developed and managed by professional nonprofit organizations whose job it is to make sure that those communities are safe for their residents and safe for the community around them. There are many, many, many jurisdiction, jurisdictions in the Bay Area that have fabulous uh, multifamily affordable housing for people who are very low income or extremely low income. We're not talking about people who necessarily are, make no money. We're talking about work, working people. And if you'll recall the slide that um, that uh, Lisa had up earlier, that a uh, very low income or uh, an extremely low income household of four is $90,000 a year. 
So we're talking about housing for people, a family of four who make $90,000 a year. We're not talking about people necessarily that are homeless. We're talking about, this is what the, the income categories show us that, that households in those categories are what the affordability is looking to target. Um, the only other thing that I would say, who pays for it? There are some jurisdictions that have developers pay for infrastructure as they, as the, they propose projects. Um, all of those kinds of issues and concerns are supposed to be addressed in the housing element in the sense that we have to disclose what we think those constraints are, work with and commit to working with the providers like water providers, et cetera, to make sure that they have capacity for that. But a lot of things, it's true, are not within a local jurisdiction's purview. So, but I think uh, overall, these are all questions that every jurisdiction that I know of is working on right now. I don't know if you have anything else. Okay. I have your comment in the room, and then I have one more comment online. The first comment would be Josh, and please state your name. And I think I do who this is. I think, yeah, um, this is a housing advocate. Your address. Hi, my name is Josh Albrechtson. I actually live in South Pasadena. That's a city right outside of downtown LA. Um, I'm at this meeting because you guys are being tweeted about online, and I've read a lot about you guys, uh, your history. So just to talk about um, water use, you guys have more lawns than the well, every city that touches your border combined, and those lawns use a lot of water. So, you know, if you want to talk about water use, a multifamily apartment complex probably uses less water than most of your single family homes in Atherton. That's not why I, I'm here, but that's just something I had to comment on. Your staff, Diana and Barbara, has gave you guys one of the best presentations I've heard in my time listening to these meetings. Probably about, I've listened to about 40 of these meetings, and they gave you one of the best ones. Um, they did good research. They talked about the other letters in other cities. I've never seen another staff give you that. So, you you know, good job on them. Um, so here in Skag, there has been no city that's been able to count SB9 uh, units, not a single one. Tons of cities have proposed SB9 units, but none of them have actually counted it. And your SB9 units are actually competing with your ADUs. Yeah. All of these lot splits are also places that likely would also have an ADU. I see you shaking your head, but that is accurate. Um, like if you have a big space, you're more likely to have a single family home with the ADU rather than a single family home that gets split off and having two single family homes. The ABAG did a study to, for your um, for your incomes for the ADUs and they came up with an average ABAG city would be able to 30% very low, 30% low, 30% moderate, 30, 10% above moderate. But they said that as an average across um, the ABAG territory. You guys are actually one of the richest um, cities in ABAC, I would be shocked that a single ADU in Atherton would ever be able to be rented to a low income unit based on the rental That's rates right. of Atherton as a whole. And, and HCD is not going to allow you guys to use those numbers to claim all those low income units that will never actually get built. Now, the uh, the organization that I think Barbara was trying to mention was California's for Home Ownership. They're the uh, realtors. They've now sued nine different cities. My city, South Pasadena, was one of them. We settled. And um, the penalty for being sued by them is... Uh, you get sued if you don't have a housing element, and the penalty is you lose all permitting activity for your city. <laughs> That's why everybody complies. You guys in Hillsboro were both mentioned by Gavin Newsom at his bill signing um, for the housing bills. You know, I don't expect HED to be nice to you guys. I think your consultants know that what you submitted is not acceptable, and I fully expect that you guys will have a couple of drafts before you can find something that is acceptable. And I also fully expect you guys would be one of the first cities sued by any of the outside organizations. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the next person is Igor. Oh my God. That was amazing. Okay. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Igor. I live in uh, Santa Clara. Um, and I just like to make a comment. Uh, one comment is that I find it pretty funny that you can have a town where the median home value is $10 million. Then you have a quote unquote community meeting and that's apparently democracy. Uh, I just like you to take a look at the room and ask what the median, uh, median income is in the room and median age oh. compared to the Bay or compared to the state at large. Uh, and as to the comment of one of the council members, uh, discrimination is not when you make over a quarter million dollars and you get to go back to your multi-acre mansion. Uh, so that's just the discriminatory comment. I'd like to address that. And uh, my question is, uh, going back to water usage, uh, what's the per capita usage of water for uh, multifamily mm. apartments compared to uh, the mansions like you have in Atherton? Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to bring it into the room. Uh, Ann Paulson. Oh, this is a housing advocate. Hi, I'm um, Ann Paulson from Los Altos. Um, thanks for letting me speak tonight. And I have uh, several comments. First is, um, I hope that I don't hear again someone saying that if there are multifamily homes in your neighborhood, it's no longer a residential area. 
people live in multifamily homes, they live in apartments, those are residents, and it's still a residential area. And that's kind of an offensive thing to say. I hope that I don't hear it again. So a few more people spoke talking about their opinions on traffic and infrastructure mitigations and everything else. And so we're now we're up to councils now answering some questions around builder's remedy. However, and there's no exemption from the California Environmental Quality Act. In that case, there's been a lot of press about a project, a huge project proposed in Redondo Beach, I think, with 25 something like 2,500 units, um, you know, where the developer is attempting to use that. But I've that's what that, that's what I covered. Anyway, it's not a, anyway. It, in that particular situation, unless the project also qualified for um, something like SB thirty five, there's some various ministerial approval processes. The city would be able to do an environmental impact report and have some control over the project. But that's what people are calling the builder's remedy. They're trying to use the claim that you can use CEQA to push back on. Um, builders remedy projects by basically putting the project in an infinite loop with um, with CEQA and just keep pushing back, requiring them to do frivolous um, uh, CEQA analysis on the project. And it's uh, it is true cities can abuse that process as something we need a legislative fix for. Eventually, a city can get sued around it. Um, we do have laws that require certain streamlining around that, um, but they're hard to enforce. It's actually an area for next year's legislative session to do some work on, but um, it's uh, interesting to hear them talk about it publicly as a possible tactic. Yeah, let me just add to that that the that that is definitely an issue that uh, is real with certain communities, and Redondo Beach is a great example. That was a uh, old power plant site that uh, the city is not in compliance with its housing element and a developer has submitted a plan uh, and is in litigation to, to assert that plan and the city council is opposed to that plan, but they, the developer is asserting that because the city is not in compliance with its housing element, they can go ahead and, and I believe that they have to have a 20% uh, low income component uh, to that development. Which they do. When your property is eight to ten million dollars an acre for an for a developer to come in and try to develop uh, a housing development in Atherton with twenty percent affordable housing as it's required by the state, it's not obvious to me that that is a risk that is a high risk to us. It's absolutely a risk if we're not in compliance with a housing element and a developer could assert a development plan that is not in compliance with the zoning regulations that we've approved. I somewhat agree, but also an acre is a lot of land. You could put a pretty good unit uh, or unit building on that property. Yes, buying the land in Atherton for what it costs would be prohibitive um, because of the per unit split to make that profitable, even with the builder's remedy. But I don't, you, you could probably pull it off still. So I think he's minimizing sort of the risk there, but I'm not going to fault him too much for it. But we are, this is the reason that the council has focused on ADUs and development at schools, which is those properties don't have to be sold. And when you buy a property that costs eight to $10 million an acre, it's very, very, very hard to build affordable housing, no matter how dense you make it. And that was a real strategic decision that this council came to after the very initial draft of our housing element in May, where we realized there's an issue of numbers of new housing that you are going to authorize and whether that housing could be affordable or not. And when looking at the needs of this community, we absolutely have uh, staff at schools and other people that are working in our town that need affordable housing. And That's true. All right, we're back to public comment again. This is wild that they do it in this order. Hi, my name is Armand Domaluski. Um, I've lived in the Bay Area my entire life. I'm currently a resident of San Francisco, but I went to school in Santa Clara and have been to Atherton uh, several times. And I just wanted to, in the context of this conversation, bring up the words of actually a resident of Atherton, Mark Andreessen, who wrote a famous article called It's Time to Build. Um, he talks about NIMBYism in opposition to housing um, throughout America. And he says, I quote, you see in housing and the physical footprint of our cities, we can't build nearly enough housing in our cities with surging economic potentials, which results in crazily skyrocketing housing prices, making it possible for regular people to move in and take jobs to the future. We can't build the cities themselves anymore when the producers of 
Westworld, for example, wanted to portray the American city of the future. They didn't film in the United States, they went to Singapore. We should have spectacular living environments in our best cities at levels way beyond what we have now. Where are they? So you don't have to listen to me. You can listen to Atherton resident Mark Andreessen about the importance of building more housing. Thank you. Okay. So Mark Andreessen is um, one of the biggest venture capitalists in um, the country. And um, he wrote this paper about this entire problem. But then he went full NIMBY within his own community, fighting housing within his own community. So incredibly hypocritical. And it's hilarious that Amon had read his quotes exactly about the problem and also quoted the person that's also writing letters to the city council to fight new housing within his own community. Chef's kiss. Okay, thank you. Mayor, we received one comment um, in a text form on the Zoom, and I just wanted to share it with you. Okay, please. So um, the person listed as Katie Snow wrote, I wanted to mention because a couple of people have mentioned the likelihood or lack thereof of low-income folks being able to rent in Atherton. I am a house manager for Atherton residents, and I rent an ADU in Orinda, spending three hours in traveling. I would love to rent a house in Atherton. So that's their comment. Case rested. Uh, Greg, did you? I went to a this meeting guy. the other night in Woodside where it was said that the housing uh, units that were allocated statewide were greater uh, than they have been in the last two or three years. And I just, uh, I find that incredible. Two or three years, like we only have the cycle every eight years. Is he saying the last two or three cycles? Because yeah, the housing crisis has exacerbated to this point where we need higher numbers to be achieved. Because we lost a congressman in the state, which means we lost a million voters to lose one congressional district. And I just want, has anybody challenged the Department of uh, Finance and the governor's office as to where the growth numbers came from? <laughs> What? Um, the uh, uh, so what happened in assigning the numbers to cities is first HCD assigned a number to the region and then they got divided among the cities. This so I, there was an auditor's report that criticized HCD's process, generally concluding that the numbers were low in many cases and maybe high in some. So I've heard that they were um, too low. there was an effort to challenge the numbers and sue HCD, but I'm not aware that such a lawsuits been filed. Um, also, there have been a number of efforts by cities, um, actually starting about uh, 10 or 12 years ago, to sue the, um, the regional agencies, in our case, it would be ABEG, although the lawsuits occurred in Southern California, to sue the regional agencies for how they distributed the numbers. And the courts have decided that, uh, basically, it's what attorneys would say, is it's not justiciable that the legislature intended the COGS to have, like ABEG, to have the sole control over distributing the number of units. And so the courts won't accept any challenges. To challenge the total number statewide. Pardon? No one's tried to challenge the- The statewide numbers, no. Thank However, we, when they- Not that I'm aware our, of, I, I know there's been an effort. When they came with our allocation a few years ago, what they were going to do, we did challenge their ideas because it was based on number of jobs being created here continued growth you know, of the population, which had actually had been shrinking. We brought all those things up and they left it the same. Then they gave us a number and we wrote back to them and they gave us a higher number as the final number. Uh, just, well, it just seems like, you know, that we <laughs> hadn't lost a congressman accurate. this year. I, you know, I could see their arguments, but I lose a million voters. And then you're saying that you're gonna increase the number of units from what it's been in the past. Yeah. Atherton's allocation like for this eight year period is 375% higher than it was for the last eight year period. Yo, and the population like most has gone places. down. It's no uh, Carol, do you want to make a comment? Live. Okay, so there were a few more speakers. Uh, it was mostly the bargaining stage of grief um, and people just saying, why don't we work on legislation to do this X, Y, and Z? Or um, then there was some discussion around ADU grants. So really not that interesting what happened at the end of the meeting because nothing came about it. They were waiting for their letter to come back from the state about the draft housing element that they submitted. Jump to November 2nd, this meeting, um, they got the letter back. Surprise, the state eviscerated them with their letter. It was, I think, 14 pages or longer um, going through how bad their housing element actually was. And now they're coming back to discuss that particular issue because now they need to do something in response to it, do that plan B that they were talking about in the first one that they didn't do the first round. So here we go. The purpose of today's item 
is to provide the public with the comments that the town received from HCD on its draft housing element. Those are provided on the town's website. Staff will provide a high level review of the significant policy issues in those comments this evening. It is apparent from the comments that there is still a long way to go before the town gets a housing element that can be certified by the state. At the end of the day, the town must have a certified housing element. In other words, we must have a housing element that complies with the state's requirements, whatever they may be or whatever they may be interpreted to be. A second part of today's item is to discuss a framework for further public outreach and engagement. Staff is seeking council guidance on what that will be or what that will look like. Staff suggests a couple of public meetings set up over December and January. And okay, so basically they're saying, we got this big letter. We need to figure out what to do with it. We also want to do more public outreach. They also are trying to press upon them the time constraint they have because if they don't get this done by uh, January 30th, then their city's out of compliance. They lose out on certain state monies. They put themselves in jeopardy for lawsuits and builder's remedy. So big deal. So I'm going to save you from the intricate detail of uh, what they have to do to meet the requirements that's being explained here uh, in all the different things. Um, but suffice it to say, their full ADU plan didn't pass muster with the state. This Parts of this letter, as I read it, were I thought were a tad bit uh, overly harsh. Uh, if you read them for what they say, maybe not what they were implied. Um, and the uh, lines, I guess. You know, it could be, and some of parts of it are are essentially an overreach on their part. An overreach. And, uh, you know, I'd like to right. hear from uh, Lisa and staff with regards to, you know, maybe go, go through some of those areas that are there, that are an overreach. And maybe some of these government codes apply and some of these government codes don't. I'd like to see that analysis by, you know, by our attorney and, and with the input from staff. Uh, this is wild. So rather than just like accepting what the letter says is a problem, they are, I don't know, what is this? Like just complaining to complain that the state is doing more than what the law allows? This is, no. <laughs> uh, we heard for some today and, and I appreciate that. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't think, I think maybe we're C minus, but I don't think we're an F personally, Bob. Um, so basically they think they're still kind of going the right direction with their housing element and they just want to sort of do some minute uh, tweaking to it to get there. There was some talk about doing the plan B that they talked to uh, or talked about in the past meeting um, from one of their members, but it seems like the rest of them just want to keep trudging forward on this terrible plan and just convincing themselves the state doesn't mean what they mean when they tell them that it's not sufficient. Wild to me. Uh, because the issue is extremely complex. Uh, it is. It's probably hard to separate questions and comments. Uh, I'll, I'll give my comment. I, I was actually very pleasantly surprised by the content in the letter that we got from HCD. I, I, I think that Bob is right, that it's extremely harsh but where it's particularly harsh is in our lack of analysis. They are very, very clear about a whole lot of areas where we lack the now, where we have lacked analysis. And and a big big part of that, I think, is what Lisa commented on about needing to uh, root our analysis in a more regional analysis. I think. Okay, so his argument is that the HCD letter came back and it said, "You need to do an analysis for these bold claims that you're claiming um, within your letter." And he thinks, well, if we put an analysis in there, then that's enough. No, they're putting this request for an analysis in the letter because they think you're bullshit. Then you're going to do the analysis. They're going to call out your analysis as bullshit, and you're still going to have to go back and do it the right way. It's just you can't go and make bold claims and then assume they're true they're not going to tell you that's not true they're going to tell you show us why it's not or why it's true and then when you do that they're going to go that's not no <laughs> you you need to go back <laughs> but i think the one line to me that stood out is that we proposed a proposal based primarily on adus and i want to ask a question so in there we said correct me on my numbers that we were going to do 35 adus a year and they said that they gave us the number back of 19. If we, we can argue, and I think we can successfully and reasonably argue that we can come up with a not number higher than 19 based on the changes and the new <laughs> policies luck. we're putting in place, 
So there's to me, a methodology we need to figure out where that number you. is. What's the reasonable number we can push back? If they're saying 19 and someone can help, I'd like to, my question is, what is the math? If we went with their 19 and that we take that number out of our ADUs, how, what is the missing units? How many units do we have to make up? And then in our unit, we're making those up. If we're doing it at 35, we're making those up with the things that are on the school, the thing at Bear Gulch. So what are the numbers? Can someone summarize for us we, what we would have to make up if we did what they said? So they came back to us saying 19. We said 35. They said 19. At 19, how many additional units do we have to produce? And if we, and what 128 more than what we have right now. So and so I would like to hear everyone's opinion of what that reasonable number might be that we're going to come back with. If we're saying 35, they're saying 19, we have a lot of grounds to argue a higher number than 19. So go. what do we think is our reasonable number to come back with? So that would be number one in my thought process. And the second is when we look at what that number produces. So if we say that number is, let's say we say, all right, 25, not 35. And we give all the reasons why it's 25. Now, how many units do we have to make up and how can we approach getting those units? The other thought I had on this was that they. Okay. So, yeah, the state has told them that under any reasonable methodology, you're going to get to 19, not 35 units um, out of this entire thing per year. And you're going to have a deficit. You're going to have to meet that deficit by upzoning something. And the city is not willing to look at that. They did it in an earlier draft of their housing element where they had an overlay zone where they were thinking about that, but citizens didn't like it. So they went this route of trying to conflate their ADU numbers. And now they have to bargain with that. It's wild. Address. Uh, I have to tell you, after reading our 16 pages and comparing it to Woodside's um, 25 pages, 16 pages, um, it's almost word for word. It's almost word for word. Yep, it, it is. It tracks paragraph by paragraph. Because they what made the they same stupid to mistakes. Woodside to what they sent to us with a little bit, you know, they talked about Canara College in there. So um, it's like this is almost a form letter that they sent back uh, to us, which they sent back to Woodside and probably Portola Valley, pretty much the same. Um, Make the same mistakes I, um, and they'll copy paste. I think it will be a stretch to uh, get an approved plan with our ADUs and without a real firm uh, commitment and plan for a multifamily uh, housing unit on Menlo College that is believable that will be able to be um, We're getting there. Within the next We're years, figuring it out. Uh, with a significant number of units uh, for low and moderate income. Um, yes. Be successful in our resubmittal. So yep. that's that's why I'm wondering about all the other cities in the state that have not had a, an approved plan, whether there's been legal action taken against them. Okay, we lost it. We'll have to go through a, a couple of those things. If, uh, the city attorney perhaps finish on, on the okay, other legal sure, comments. No problem. Thank you. Yes, um, I can speak to the issue of legal challenges, um, but before I do, I think it's really important to acknowledge some of the frustration that the community and decision makers are feeling with respect to the sixth cycle. Um, this is being felt across many communities within the state, um, and it does feel like there's a whole lot of regulations being jammed down your throat. Um, and the reason for that, in part, is because we have a lot more legislation that has been effective in this cycle that was not effective when we were reviewing the housing element last time. Um, and the ago. Uh, Housing and Community Development Department and Attorney General's Office have been financially incentivized and have just a lot more ability to enforce some of their provisions. So what we're seeing right now is, or what I'm seeing anyways, is what I describe a little bit of a chaotic litigation because everyone is suing everyone. Um, YIMBY, which is yes in my backyard, has sued HCD on the grounds that there's not enough um, housing uh, and they think that there should be the arena number should be increased even more that's me i'm literally on the lawsuit that filed for this lawsuit and we won that so i did a video about that in the past about how we won that and then we have communities particularly in southern california coronado san diego area um suing hcd on the grounds that the arena numbers were not properly calculated um the courts <laughs> have responded to that um just this year I'm there was tough. a decision city of coronado versus san diego um, association of governments saying that California courts do not have jurisdiction to adjudicate claims involving objections to regional housing <laughs> needs assessments. 
We're seeing an increase uh, of um, court decisions backing up and giving deference to HCD's interpretation of housing element laws yes. um, because they're the regulatory agency. We're also seeing that the Attorney General's Office and HCD are joining in lawsuits against public agencies, mostly cities, um, who are failing to approve projects that might be high density or that um, uh, have not um, move forward with their housing element. So there's yes. ample amount of litigation, but unfortunately there's nothing promising that I can tell you that would relieve or um, lessen the burden with respect to our obligations to implement some of the goals and objectives that have been set forth. Um, with that, the I'm gonna cope. turn it over to Barbara and Diane to uh, contribute any comments. The COPE, man. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> I'm Barbara Couch. I'm a partner at Goldfarb and Lippmann and we, uh, <laughs> pretty much have been focusing my practice recently on the housing laws. And I just wanted to emphasize some of the things that are in the HCD letter that I think will make it very problematic to continue to rely on an ADU strategy. Um, first of all, the way the statute is drafted, HCD mm. has pretty much the sole authority to decide to what extent you can utilize ADUs to, to resolve your housing, you know, to satisfy some of your housing needs. Yeah. Um, Besides the issue about how many ADUs can be counted, there is the issue of whether they can be counted as lower income households. One of the, they have a comment as serving lower income households. They say the element must also address affordability assumptions for ADU projections. Mm -hmm. And so right now the, the city, the town is saying that 60% of, of the ADUs constructed will be affordable to lower income households. And I doubt that they will in the end accept that without say additional surveys by the town. Another issue has to do with SB9 units. The element as it's drafted projects that lot splits uh, under SB9 will create 96 units. What the, what the letter says is that the city needs to identify specifically which sites will be, um, will be developed or are designated to be developed for SB9 units and provide evidence that the owners and that the owners are interested in creating those units they're going to have to call literally everyone in town and ask them are you interested in building another unit on their house and i think the vast majority are going to tell them no and their claims that so many units are not going to be built is not going to hold water and oh just delicious 96 units is a lot of units that this that the town has projected so far um, by ridiculous. the way, this is like their standard, their standard comment on SB9 units. They basically are very suspicious, you might say, of anybody claim, of any community claiming a significant number of SB9 units. Um, I mean, right now your total arena is 348 oh, units. Already. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I am just saying what they will demand is that you identify exactly where those units are going to go. Um, and lastly, I agree with comments that several council members made that they will not accept this without, without multifamily zoning at 20 units an acre, because I do not believe that, there, that the town would have evidence that lower income housing can be created at lower densities than that. Um, and evidence that those units will likely, um, that the sites are actually adequate and likely to be built. Now they could be built in the school sites, but you don't really, you only, you're only projecting uh, 24 units on those school sites and the town's total I just bravo to this outside consultant that the city attorney hired um, to basically go over what's happening in the state and bravo to that city attorney that spoke before mentioning all the litigation they're really doing what they have to to try to convince the city council that the direction that they're going um, the one that the citizens demanded is just gonna put them in litigation <sighs> I think your city attorney gave an excellent um, summary of the litigation, what's been happening with litigation recently, which is that the cases have pretty much all been going against cities. We've seen courts even, um, even make, uh, you know, even adopt uh, uh, opinions about density bonuses that, you know, that are damaging to cities without the issue even being briefed by any of the parties. Um, and I think, I think, um, you know, so far the cities have, the cities and the counties are really portrayed in the press and by 
in, in the courts as the bad guys in this process. <laughs> and we could argue about, you know, whether some of the things in the HCD letter are overreach. I mean, I probably share your frustrations when I read these letters, but it kind of doesn't go anywhere. And so our usual advice <laughs> to clients is to do your best to try to get a, a certified and approved housing element, because if the courts take it over, the results will be much worse than you could than you could uh, than the Don't solution give up you your own local yourselves. control. Just follow I don't think I have rules. anything else to add. <sighs> I'm just gonna, I'm Diana Elrod. I'm a housing consultant. I do a lot of the housing elements. I uh, have been doing so for more than 20 years. And um, your letter of 16 pages is about um, average length. And this is probably by saying that that's like eight times as long as they used to be. Um, and I want to, in particular, I think everything has been covered and I don't need to respond to anything, but the issue on page five, where it talks about zoning for lower income households, it is direct in saying the element must demonstrate zoning appropriate to accommodate housing for lower income households. That's not ADUs for lower income households, that's zoning. In other words, the, the town must have zoning of at least of 20 units to the acre to comply with the requirement for having multifamily housing. Um, and how that's accommodated Actually, is also units, going to be, of, you know, where it's located units, is going to be of great interest 20. to the state um, because of the overlay and the lens of affirmatively furthering fair housing. If it turns out that the folks that uh, are, let's say, on a school site, for example, maybe they're, do they represent the, the demographic population of the county as a whole, i.e. The, the, they're in terms of um, race and ethnicity? If the if that is the case, then that would pass muster. But if the if the population it does not God, address it does muster. not reflect the community as a whole, then unfortunately the state will have things to will will per perhaps come down even further and require more work done. I think it's great to have identified sites via schools, but I I based on some of the language in this letter and some of the language I've seen elsewhere, I'd be very careful about ensuring that there is specifically land that is zoned in places that will respond to AFFH concerns. And Diana, all... just, just to be. Okay, that was so much. They got by all their consultants and city attorney and just told you can't go down this path. You have to divert, you have to work on actually zoning for multifamily housing. Your ADU only plan is ridiculous. So council just did a bunch of back and forth questions, talked about some specific sites, talked about the school, talked about where they might be able to find housing. And now we're getting on to public comment. Yeah, I still uh, question the number that we start with, the number of <laughs> units. And I don't know that, uh, I just think that somebody needs to Wild. take a hard look at those numbers because I still don't believe them that we justify 348 units and nobody has gone up and raised hell with whoever calculated them and figured out where in the heck they're getting it. <laughs> those high beginning. numbers compared to what they were eight years ago. Oh boy, this guy. And I just, uh, I mean, we lost a, set, uh, a congressman in California means we lost Talking about a million about people. Congressman again. So how could, how could we have increases of this magnitude when the overall shift in California is down, not up? So that's one of my concerns. It's because other populations The other thing is where are, are these low income people going to come from? Are, are, is, this, is this a reallocation of people or is this, are we just trying to, do more in what we have because we, it, the college students, I mean, they aren't family income. He's kind of droned on, so I'll save you and skip it. Um, talking about low income housing and where the housekeepers are going to live. Wild stuff. Good, but I don't think we got work to do before we get up in front of exactly. the citizens and exactly. look like a bunch of dummies. Yeah, we'll schedule the what special was, meeting sometime in November. Was, is that we would have to all have the same um, play, playbook, you know? And, for each meeting. So we're all talking the same, at least presenting the same information and then let residents talk back to us. It's like what we did with the um, Civic Center project. Okay. okay, so a lot of back and forth discussion over what they wanted to do ultimately that I saved you from there. Um, a lot of it is just floundering to find a, a solution, but basically they want to go back to the community, do more community outreach and go back and forth. And I think it's wild because they don't have much time. It's November 5th. Their housing element has to be adopted by January um, uh, 30th. If they send another letter back, HCD will take at least a month. So they basically have to finish this by the end of December. And with holidays and everything, that's wild. They're not going to be able to do it. So they're definitely going to miss their housing deadline, I think, if they go this approach. They should be directing staff to um, take action to, like, 
find places to zone and come back quickly with something within like a few weeks and then they can send that to HD. But uh, they're going to go to a different approach. They're going to they're going to go full rounds here again. This is uh let's see if it works out for them. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Logistically, how are we going to First of all, I love this idea, but logistically, how are we going to do it? and be and still be inclusionary so for example are we gonna if, if you just say all right i'm going to do it in my area am i mailing it just to my neighbors uh adapt has zone specific emails so we can email all 300 people in my neighborhood or are we going to publicly notice them or send them out like it's going to be in this neighborhood here how are we going to get people because if we're just my god so that's it um, they're going to do more community outreach. They're going to go back and forth and try to talk with their community about uh, what they have to do. And uh, no concise plan was uh, determined yet. So good luck, Atherton. 